Right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds this morning. Happy to have everybody uh, here with us in person and uh, many more of you uh, online. We will be having two, uh, two talks today um, from Drs. Uh, Rice and Peters. So I believe that uh, Dr. Rice is going to be going first, but um, uh, CME wise, we'll do uh, color is green today. And um, I think that uh, that's right, we have our uh, trauma team mostly away at uh, OTA, so everybody be careful on the streets. Um, and uh, we'll look forward to uh, our first talk this morning from Dr. Rice. We'll invite her on up here to, to uh, begin. Oh, interesting. Swap, swap presentation. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I know, but then we were we figured something out before, but it's not gonna work. Okay. It's either gonna show. What's this showing on Zoom? I'm doing it with, uh, I don't know. Yeah, okay. Oh. That's okay. I've got a backup plan. <laughs> uh, how do I turn off prisoner view in here? Okay, um, sorry for the technical difficulties. My name is Olivia Rice, and today I'm going to be talking about um, orthopedic surgery, uh, smoking cessation strategies. I have nothing to disclose. So most of us are aware by now that smoking negatively affects um, our patients and surgical outcomes. Dr. Brian Bean gave a great talk on this a few years ago, um, documenting the, the harmful effects across MSK, MSK subspecialties. To summarize, Smokers are at a greater risk of multiple complications, especially problems with infection and wound healing after surgical interventions. So we know smoking is bad, but today I wanna to take a closer look at our underlying assumptions about the effects of smoking and safe cessation methods. Namely, how does smoking negatively affect our outcomes? And when we refer to smoking, what exactly are we talking about? Because there's a lot of things that people can smoke. And finally, what are the most effective ways of helping patients actually quit smoking before and after surgery? So how is smoking harmful? Well, what is it about the physical inhalation of toxic substances that appears to be more harmful than other methods of substance abuse? I consistently came across four aspects of smoking that seem to drive their toxic effect, namely carcinogens, which uh, cause cancer, not surprising, but these are more long-term um, effects in smokers. In the short term, there are three major players um, that affect smokers. First is nicotine, which keeps people coming back for more. Second is carbon monoxide, and lastly, the method of toxin delivery by inhalation to the lungs, which turns out to be a unique factor that significantly increases harm. Nicotine is a chemical that is dangerous, not because it causes cancer, but because it addicts people to cigarettes. Nicotine is described in pharmacology textbooks in a fairly simplistic way. However, in vivo, its actions are actually quite complicated. Nicotine stimulates nicotinic receptors, causing a sympathoexcitatory effect, ultimately releasing acetylcholine from postganglionic nerve endings. As catecholamines, norepinephrine and epinephrine primarily, can cause vasoconstriction, for years, nicotine has been, nicotine has been held responsible for the primary, as the primary villain behind detrimental effects of smoking on wound healing. So that's what we've been taught, but what does the evidence say? It turns out there's actually accumulating evidence that the vasoactive effect of nicotine may not be mediated by nicotine alone. 
uh, basal effect of smoking, sorry, may not be mediated by nicotine alone. To prove this, studies administer nicotine extract uh, in isolation to observe its uh, effects independent of smoking. Many in vitro studies of this um, showed dose-dependent effects with, with low doses showing increased angiogenesis and osteoblast activity, while at higher doses, there's impairment of inflammatory cell migration and growth. Animal studies are actually quite conflicting, uh, with some studies showing uh, a de decreased peripheral perfusion with nicotine infusion, while others showing uh, actually um, wound proliferation uh, studies showed that stimulating, uh, that nicotine actually stimulated wound healing with angiogenesis in rats. Clinically, um, studies on nicotine replacement therapy have shown no evidence that nicotine in isolation actually causes decreased tissue perfusion. So in a, study, in a clinical study by two, in 2009 by Sorensen and colleagues, they showed that cutaneous and subcutaneous blood flows were affected differently by pure nicotine versus smoking. IV infusion of one milligram of nicotine uh, preferentially increased uh, cutaneous blood flow by lowering subcutaneous blood flow. And in contrast, smoking induced distinct and significant reductions in tissue blood flow, oxygen tension, and aerometabolism. The effects of nicotine on cutaneous um, on cutaneous blood flow is also supported by an experiment showing that nicotine gum actually increased cutaneous blood flow and skin temperature. And finally, nicotine patch therapy, um, when given to smokers with coronary artery disease attempting to quit, actually reduced myocardial ischemia during exercise. So carbon monoxide is, is produced from uh, incomplete combustion of organic compounds while smoking, including tobacco, marijuana, and wood, charcoal, and even human, human tissue. So yes, carbon monoxide is inhaled from bovie smoke. Uh, it's considered harmful mainly due to its effect on oxygen metabolism. Uh, it binds hemoglobin, becoming carboxyhemoglobin, which ultimately impedes the release of oxygen to, to the tissues. As you may imagine, carboxyhemoglobin levels are elevated to about 5% in uh, habitual smokers compared to almost none in non-smokers. And in summary, nicotine and carbon monoxide together uh, create an imbalance between oxygen consumption and oxygen availability which leads us to inhalation in general. So smoking is a unique form of drug administration that um, the entry into the circulation through the pulmonary rather than the portal or systemic venous circulations uh, increases or causes a lag time between smoking and entry into the brain that's shorter than IV injection actually. And intake of chemicals, including nicotine and carbon monoxide uh, from a given product is dependent not only on the amount generated from the smoke uh, product, but the inhalation uh, technique as well, namely puff volume, rate and intensity, as well as depth and inhalation, depth of inhalation. For example, marijuana and tobacco smoke contain roughly the same amount of carbon monoxide, but typically marijuana smokers hold their smoke in their lungs for much longer, which results uh, in carboxyhemoglobin levels up to five times that of a, a typical smoker. So it turns out that marijuana smoke is harmful after all, which, Brings me to the next uh, point, at least for me personally, whenever I hear the word smoking, my brain automatically jumps to cigarettes. And I think patients probably, probably think this way too, which has important implications on the screening process. Because even the Google definition of smoking mentions the word tobacco. However, um, and it's true that the majority of the literature surrounding negative health effects of smoking pertain to cigarettes, but there's increasing evidence that smoking of any organic substance actually has detrimental physiologic effects. So for example, smoking marijuana has often been advertised as harmless um, compared to cigarette smoking, but there's increasing evidence supporting the contra contrary. Again, the emphasis here is on smoked marijuana as other forms of uh, consumption have not shown the same harmful effects. But the most common route of marijuana administration is inhalation due to smoking and due to its unfiltered nature, the amount of carcinogens and irritants like tar that enter the upper airway is increased approximately threefold with far more deposition um, of tar into the respiratory tract compared to cigarettes. We also know that uh, routine marijuana smoking impacts surgical outcomes. Uh, pulmonary, effect, pulmonary effects include increased airway edema and obstruction um, and reduced pulmonary function and the myocardial infarction risk is elevated fivefold an hour after cannabis use. To wrap up this session, I just briefly want to mention e-cigarettes and vaping because I think we're going to see a lot more of it in the near future. And because um, electronic cigarettes don't expose users to comparable levels of carcinogens or carbon monoxide, uh, they're technically considered more safe than combustible cigarettes. However, um, the most worrisome population are adolescents who, uh, if they use electronic cigarettes, are at much increased risk of using typical combustible cigarettes, likely because the majority of these 
deliver as much, if not more nicotine compared to the average um, combustible cigarette. So it's important that we're aware of all of these um, different types of smoking so that we can ask patients about it accordingly. For example, less than a third of adolescents reporting electronic uh, cigarette use understood that nicotine was delivered was derived from tobacco. So screening questions must carefully be framed to account for such misconceptions. So before getting started about uh, cessation strategies, I think it's a reasonable question to ask, does quitting smoking for a period of time uh, before or after surgery actually make a difference? Is smoking cessation a worth, worthwhile investment uh, to improve our, our outcomes or are smokers sort of at a higher risk for complications regardless? It turns out that yes, there is very strong evidence that smoking cessation restores tissue oxygenation and metabolism fairly rapidly. And several studies have found that smoking cessation prior to surgical procedures um, likely reduces the risk of post-op complications. However, the, the minimum duration of absence, abstinence necessary to uh, confer benefit from smoking cessation likely depends on the complication that's being evaluated. So, Given that there's a recognized benefit uh, to cessation, including risk reduction for our patients undergoing surgery, we should feel ethically obliged to at least attempt to optimize our patients' modifiable risk factors. So what does our cessation effort require in order to be effective? A systematic uh, review from Cochrane a few years ago looked at the pre-op cessation tactics and included that the minimal uh, requirements for efficacy included an initial face-to-face a counseling session, an offer of drug therapy, which was usually nicotine replacement therapy in the trials, and availability of long-term follow-up. How to provide these elements depends on uh, practice-specific factors. So regardless of the subspecialty or practice that you're in, all patient smoking cessation starts with uh, asking about smoking or screening. So the surgical patient seeks care to tackle the underlying condition necessitating surgery, not necessarily tobacco dependence. So for most patients, um, they know that smoking you know, puts them at harm's way and that they want to quit eventually, but they're unaware of the immediate risks in the perioperative setting and uh, may not appreciate the acute need for tobacco treatment. The good news is that um, we also can get reimbursed for uh, tobacco cessation counseling um, and Medicare covers um, the following intensive versus intermediate sessions, um, up to eight sessions per year. So the consensus recommendation for optimal timing of cessation in elective surgery seems to be at least four weeks with longer periods of cessation even more desirable. A general surgery meta-analysis done by Wong in 2012, which included seven studies, recognized an inflection point uh, for improved outcomes around three to four weeks of smoking cessation prior to surgery. Uh, it reports relative risk reduction of 0.74 for patients who stopped smoking compared to those who didn't. And a meta-analysis done by Mills um, in 2011 demonstrated similar risk uh, reductions um, with pre-op cessation across a variety of post-op complications uh, with actually a compounding increase in magnitude of effect for, of about 20% for each additional week of cessation prior to surgery. And although um, ideally uh, smoking cessation should be encouraged in the pre-op period, uh, it's not always feasible, especially in the situation of trauma and fractures. Um, and luckily there is a study that showed um, the effect of a, a standardized six week smoking cessation program started immediately after uh, fracture surgery, uh, found that a proportion of patients who experienced this, um, who, who uh, the intervention was performed on had significantly less complications uh, than those to which no um, smoking counseling was given. And so the Cochrane uh, review that is making these recommendations evaluated the efficacy of, of all the different types of preoperative um, interventions on smoking cessation. In, their, uh, in the instance of post-op complications. Most trials consisted of a combination of um, behavioral therapy and nicotine replacement therapy. Uh, two trials uh, in particular included an intensive session, meaning that they met multiple times for um, at least four weeks before surgery. And therefore, um, while the other ones did, the, just did a brief intervention, uh, for example, mentioning that the, the patient should quit smoking. Um, the different types of behavioral interventions were so heterogeneous in the outcomes that they actually pooled them together um, to analyze them separately. And so an effect on cessation at the time of surgery was apparent in both subgroups. And although the effect uh, was larger for intensive interventions, but in regards to long-term cessation, it appears that patients who experienced the brief interventions relapsed as only the intense interventions, uh, patients remained um, effectively uh, abstinent from smoking a year out from surgery. And regarding the impact on total post-op and wound complications, only the intensive intervention group showed a significant reduction. Well, for brief interventions, um, where the impact of smoking cessation was smaller, there was 
no evidence um, of redu reducing complications. So it should be noted also that both the intensive intervention trials um, and brief intervention trials um, offer nicotine replacement therapy um, in order for their patients, while the standard group uh, received little to no information about smoking. And both trials included patients undergoing orthopedic surgery. So the initial face-to-face -face needs to happen um, and doesn't have to take very long. Uh, like I said, it can be as simple as just mentioning to your patients that um, asking them if they smoke and encouraging smoking cessation. Um, and in fact, as a surgeon, we have a little bit of leverage. So there's a meta-analysis in 2013 supporting the concept that surgical patients may actually be uniquely receptive uh, to interventions, finding that tobacco treatment for oncology patients was significantly affected uh, quit rates only when applied in the perioperative period. So getting further into nicotine replacement therapy, um, they come in a variety of forms, such as gums, patches, lozenges, et cetera, some requiring um, prescription and some not. And they have been shown to increase the efficacy of tobacco use interventions, increasing the likelihood that patients can maintain um, abstinence from smoking. So as I mentioned earlier, more and more evidence is showing that nicotine replacement therapy is very, very safe in the perioperative period and should be offered to patients routinely. In one of the largest observational studies of surgical patients to date, uh, they showed that perioperative um, nicotine replacement therapy is not associated with any adverse outcomes after surgery and concluded that their results strengthened the evidence that NRT should be prescribed routinely in the perioperative period uh, for patients that need it. Several cl clinical studies have also found similar things. Um, and uh, although further study is needed um, to comprehensively evaluate the effect of NRT on post-op outcomes, there's currently no evidence that nicotine is harmful to surgical patients when administered in doses consistent with those provided by the nicotine replacement therapy. So furthermore, plasma nicotine levels prevent um, uh, in patients with using NRT are substantially lower than those um, in active smokers. So if nicotine alone, um, even if nicotine alone does have detrimental effects, uh, the exposure through uh, nicotine replacement therapy is preferable to cigarette smoke, which has higher levels of nicotine in addition to numerous other toxins, um, as we mentioned before. So although the evidence suggests um, that most forms of NRT are safe and effective for use in surgical patients, the data on electronic cigarettes is a little bit uh, less clear. Uh, electronic cigarettes are becoming popular uh, as quit aids as well as alternatives to cigarettes, uh, likely due to the perception that they're healthier less addictive. However, um, we know that cigarettes, e-cigarettes contain more nicotine than traditional cigarettes. And unlike the other uh, nicotine replacement therapies, they contain a variety of chemicals in addition to nicotine. So the only clinical study showing any sort of harm associated with nicotine replacement therapy um, was a plastic surgery paper, which showed higher complication rate, um, especially with wound healing in patients um, using NRT that included patients using e-cigarettes. So, I know that nicotine replacement therapy has previously been avoided um, <clears throat> due to concern for vasoconstriction of the skin and tissue, but the reality is the overwhelming uh, evidence uh, supports its safety. And the benefits of um, replacement therapy far outweigh the largely theoretical risks since using NRT is proven uh, to significantly increase the likelihood of smoking cessation success. So the reason we hold tight to these beliefs and practices is due to fear. Um, which so sort of sounds like a little bit of a broken record. So um, I would encourage all of you to not let the emotions hijack you, but to let the evidence guide you uh, to making the best choice uh, for your patients to maximize their success of smoking cessation. And finally, the last aspect uh, is long-term follow-up. And luckily for us, Atrium Health has a robust smoking cessation program that's available uh, for any of our patients to use at any time. Alternatively, you could also outsource the entire smoking cessation um, practice to them completely uh, and make sure that all the smokers that come to you for surgery are automatically referred uh, to smoking cessation counseling. So in conclusion, I'd like to make some final recommendations uh, for, affecting, for effective uh, smoking awareness and cessation strategies. One is just to read the literature um, regarding smoking cessation very closely. Smoking does not equal nicotine and, and vice versa. Talk to your patients about smoking before and after surgery. Post-op cessation is just as important as preoperative cessation, and make sure that you're explaining the benefits of cessation in the context of their surgery. Even in pediatrics, um, make sure you use terminology that your patients are familiar with. Smoking anything is likely harmful, so if necessary, encourage oral or transdermal consumption of substances if necessary. 
And finally, use Atrium Health Smoking Cessation Resources. Um, they're available to us. And don't forget to bill for smoking cessation counseling if you do it yourself. Um, and I'd also encourage you to offer a nicotine replacement therapy for cessation assistance, and, but encourage patients to avoid using e-cigarettes if at all possible. Because again, there's increased like, likelihood of smoking cessation using NRT, and despite theoretical uh, physiologic effects of isolated nicotine, the harm from smoking is much, much greater than the harm from nicotine replacement therapy. Thank you. Um, so it's very interesting. I really had no idea about the uh, nicotine replacement. I've historically always just been like, I can't imagine that's much better. But seeing this data, um, is it easy? Do you just pick any over the counter or prescription version and give them a starting dose? Is there you know, are there obvious contraindications to it? Any guidelines on prescribing nicotine replacement therapy? Yeah, so I didn't get into much of the prescribing because there's, there's some things that you, you can do in addition to just the, the patches or lozenges, such as like barencycline or um, bupropion. Um, and so my thought is that if, if you're going to be the one sort of encouraging patients to use nicotine replacement therapy, if they're fine with an over-the-counter solution, which is a majority of the patches um, and the lozenges, then they can do that. If they're going to um, want something else, in my mind as surgeons, that's probably where we sort of refer to the smoking cessation people. Um, but there's definitely, not that I can tell, there's not a ton of contraindications to it. Um, it's before, I mean, historically it's been thought that you shouldn't give it to patients surrounding surgery, but it really has shown no evidence of any detrimental effects. So if it helps them, you know, stop smoking, that's, that's the preferred option. Samuel. Okay. Um, yeah so, for sure um and I, I didn't have time to kind of go into this today but um there's actually a couple of different uh, tests that you can do. Carbon monoxide uh, breath exhalation testing has actually recently been shown to be just as sensitive and specific. Um, before it was sort of questioned because it has a short, like being able to detect carbon monoxide has a shorter half-life uh, than um, the urine test. Um, so people were kind of worried like, oh, well, the patient could smoke yesterday and then, um, you know, we wouldn't, wouldn't detect it. But actually um, people that are really still smoking, uh, you can still detect it. Um, there's an additional, there's an additional metabolite too. And um, the name is blanking me right now, but there's an additional urine test that's actually uh, sensitive only for smokers and not for nicotine replacement therapy um, that is available as well. Another question, uh, which is it's probably not an entirely fair question, but as somebody who has actually dated four people and smoke a lot more, but also have a little bit of obesity, you know, both things that they use often to tell me by increasing weight. Yeah, so I didn't come across anything in specific to like them having trouble keeping off weight. Um, the main comorbidity that I actually came across was depression. Um, and actually smoking cessation improves depression symptoms similar to um, an SSRI, which is sort of interesting, but um, I didn't really see much on the obesity aspect, but I didn't really look for it either, so. Oh, hello. Oh. <laughs> yeah, a couple things. I put I put into the chat. Um, sorry, my video is not working. I put into the chat the um, there's a CDC um, um, website for quitting smoking. Um, and the reason why I put that in there is while we have a smoking cessation program here, um, it, it's a little bit of a barrier for for patients. And so this is uh, both an accessible and scalable solution for all patients. Um, and the other thing is that it's pretty easy to give people nicotine replacement therapy. I've been doing it for years. I've been doing it both in the inpatient and the outpatient side, just like 
all discussed, um, over the counter is probably the easiest way to go. Um, it is okay to even prescribe some of the other medications like Wellbutrin or Shantix, but I would tell you that you, you, you need to do a PHQ-9 um, before you do so. Um, there's a slight increase for suicidality with some of those medications, but um, if you're doing uh, if you're doing the depression screening already, um, as a lot of us are doing in our clinics, then, then it kind of keeps you um, a little bit in, a, in good shape with, uh, with respect to that. And, and I've actually really found it to be fairly effective to, uh, to do smoking cessation programs with it. I think some of the important things too, in a non-judgmental way that Dr. Rice mentioned is, is talking about other substances that people are, are inhaling in a, in a combustible manner. Um, with regards to, to testing, we are working on perioperative testing right now to make it a little more streamlined and easy. Um, as many of you may know, it's a send out test currently for serum or urine codeine, but there are other different tests that can be done. And we're trying to bring a lot of that stuff in house so that's, that it's um, a little more readily available. Olivia, one, one question. I know we need to move on, but um, if some of you all know, we're in the GID trials, it's a multi center trial, the study of therapy for garbage. Mm -hmm. And um, we have, as one of our excluding criteria, tobacco. Mm -hmm. And I had a patient on my screen last Thursday who otherwise is a perfect candidate, but they were using a nic nicotine replacement therapy for using a the patch. Mm -hmm. Based on what you're showing me here, there really is no reason to exclude that patient. No, not unless they're, as long as they're not actually smoking in addition to the nicotine patch, but that would be the one, the one caveat. Yeah. We'll, we'll revisit that. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Next up.